said, I think, I hope this is a mega find. And it's turned out to be just that, a, a mega find. If we've got live dinosaurs, we could time them like I've just timed this race. Warm-bloodedness is a wonderful adaptation. It carries a tremendous price. The price of eating all the time at fabulous rates. <laughs> The Dinosaurs is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. Dinosaurs have vanished from the face of the Earth. But from beneath the Earth, their bones still cast a spell luring paleontologists, tourists, and amateur bone hunters, even to such out-of-the-way places as Jordan, Montana. For the folks of Garfield County, prospecting for bones is a hobby that can get exciting at any moment. On Labor Day, 1988, Ranchers Tom and Kathy Wankel drove out into the Montana hills. Oh, I've always been a rock hound all my life. I've, I've um, loved arrowheads and about anything old, and I've always walked around looking at the ground. Well, that morning we had the good fortune of having babysitters for our kids, so we were on our own, and we wanted to get out early when the, the morning light seemed to be more productive. I had hiked around the low part of one set of hills and he'd went another way but we met at the top of one small hill and out of the corner of my eye I'd spotted a ridge of bones and um, I don't know just I was shaking I remember that. After she dug it up a little bit you know and scratched around she got more and more excited and she said I think I hope this is a mega find and it's turned out to be just that, a, a mega find, very important. Kathy Wangel had found an almost complete Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the rarest finds in the history of dinosaur studies. And now a crew of paleontologists from the Museum of the Rockies is painstakingly easing the skeleton out of its rocky cradle. bones like doctors, setting them in a protective plaster cast, and then digging the underside out one inch at a time. Crew Chief Pat Liege. You're looking at the top part of the skull. This is the back here, and this is the front where the snout would be. And this circle in here is where the left eye would have been, right here. The right eye would have been there. And this section here is an upper jaw called the maxilla, and you can see a tooth, very long tooth, extending out. It's just going right underneath the nasal of the skull. The skeleton lies twisted in the ground, just where the animal fell. But what did the beast look like when it was alive? In the past 50 years, one of the great triumphs of dinosaur studies has been to put flesh on the bones, and in so doing, to change much of what we thought we knew about these creatures. Mm -hmm. 
This is Yale University's Peabody Museum, where John Ostrom is curator. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. It portrays time over a span of about 350 million years from the Devonian period back in the Paleozoic all the way up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. It's called the Age of Reptiles. Here is the old picture of dinosaurs. Pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage, gorging themselves on leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. It was 1964. John Ostrom recalls that he had been digging for months in Low County, Montana, and not finding very much. Time had run out. His crew had packed up their equipment and were heading for their cars. You know, we've been looking for five years before we found anything as exciting as this. Close to where the cars were parked, Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Since his tools were already stowed away, he began to scrape the dirt with his fingernails. This is what he saw first. Startling. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Notice the extraordinarily large claws, sharp, curved, clearly the hands of a predaceous animal. Uh, associated, found very close to this, uh, was this object, obviously a claw which I thought belonged to the hand because it looks very much like the claws on those fingers. But there was no place for it to fit. And I puzzled over that for some time, but we found the answer. Turns out that that claw didn't belong to the hand at all. In fact, it belonged to the foot. But then something more came to light in our quarry. And uh, I'll show you just a part of it. Bits and pieces of the tail encased in bundles of ossified tendons all along each right side, left side, underneath. This made the tail completely stiff, like a, what I picture as a balancing pole. It kept the animal, helped the animal keep its balance while it was using those sickles on its feet for killing whatever it was hungry for. Ostrom named the animal Deinonychus, terrible claw, a killing machine that came into being more than a hundred million years ago and used both hands and feet to snatch and rend its prey, keeping its balance by the remarkable adaptation in its tail. Nothing like the galumphing brutes in the Yale mural, but a speedy acrobat, a racer. Pontefract racetrack outside Leeds, England. This is where McNeil Alexander comes to figure out how fast a dinosaur actually could move. Back in the 70s, people were arguing whether the dinosaurs were lumbering monsters or formidable running machines. And it wasn't an easy question to answer because the dinosaurs are dead. <laughs> 